So there's a robust literature on the comorbidity of depression, anxiety, and chronic pain. Approximately 50% of patients who suffer from chronic non-malignant pain suffer from some degree of depression. Uh, part of the issue, how I got interested in the field of uh, pain, depression, and suicide is that there was a lot of discussion around the unintentional uh, overdose of opioid analgesics. And I uh, thought, uh, well, how do we know it's unintentional? That these are very brittle people who have significant psychiatric, psychological problems, many losses in their life, including jobs, family roles, and who's to say that it's, in, that it's unintentional? And I think there's a subgroup of people that are what I call the silent you know, uh, minority or majority uh, that suffer from depression and have thoughts of ending their life. Well, I think there's a convergence. I mean, if you look at the literature on, on pain patients and suicidal ideation, the prevalence is anywhere between 18 and 50 percent. If you look at individuals who suffer from the disease of addiction or substance use disorders, uh, it's equally as high a prevalence. If you take someone who has the, the dual disease of pain and substance use disorder, it's basically a powder keg. Uh, again, they have multiple losses, they have multiple risk factors uh, for developing you know, severe depressions and suicidal ideation with a fair degree of risk for actually committing suicide. So I, I think what primary care physicians can do, because they, they really are the ones that are in the in the, the real battleground of taking care of these patients. You know, they prescribe probably over 50% of the opiates. Uh, they have the least amount of resources. And I think that there's multiple sort of risk factors. One is sleep disturbance. Uh, sleep disorders are very common in pain patients, very common in people with substance use disorders. What we know from the literature is that people who have sleep disorders, that it actually increases pain. Uh, via causing an increase in a substance called cytokines, which is a pro-inflammatory process. And we also know from human experimental studies that when people are sleep deprived, particularly REM sleep deprived, that it actually uh, decreases their pain tolerance. So patients get into this cycle of poor sleep, pain, pain causing sleep problems, and it can cause this whole cycle that leads to more depression, more anxiety, more um, um, uh, uh, despair. Uh, I think that we don't aggressively treat sleep disorders in pain patients. I think we throw this sort of molecule de jour at them, but there are some very effective treatments both pharmacologically and non-pharmacologically, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, insomnia, sleep hygiene, along with the right use of certain medications that can restore um, sleep, which would actually decrease the risk of suicide and also probably Im improve pain. There are factors that are, that are involved in mediating sort of the, the relationship between pain and suicide um, are, you know, catastrophizing. And then, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, my pain's going to get worse. Um, so again, there's effective interventions for this. So I think the primary care physician obviously is not a pain psychologist or psychiatrist, but they need to be cognizant that these factors can exacerbate the pain, exacerbate their depression, and put them at risk for suicide. So I think it's being aware of what the risk factors are in this patient population. I think that's using monitoring tools, both looking at depression, suicidal ideation, and the tendency towards substance misuse, and having a plan of action, like what, what's, what uh, services are available in the community that can help these patients if they tend to score high in depression, anxiety, or high risk for suicide. Well, I think the issue is, is that part of it is access issues, you know, and that's a, that's a problem we, we really face in this country is that it's really easier to see the Pope uh, than it is to get a, a, go see a psychiatrist or a, a good psychotherapist. Oftentimes the people who are most vulnerable have the least amount of resources, so if they can even get into a, prime, uh, to a behavioral health specialist, they tend to be not particularly well trained, they tend to be younger, less, less used to these complex cases, so I think that's a bigger issue. Some of the things that I've sort of suggested is that we have to start looking at, at e-health type of technologies like 
uh, downloadable phone apps, uh, telemedicine. There's some computer-assisted cognitive behavioral therapy that have been extremely effective for treating very refractory conditions such as cocaine addiction. So I think we have to think outside the box. I think that we, we sit up and talk, talk and give lectures about this is the ideal way of dealing with these patients, but if the patient can't get access to the services, then it's all lip service. So I think primary care physicians, if they're seeing certain pattern changes, like the patient comes in, they're having more anxiety, more stress, they've had recent losses, like a divorce, lost their job, lost roles, um, and they suffer from depression, that puts them in an elevated risk for at least suicidal ideation, if not behavior. Um, increased pain intensity, uh, decrease in function. So I think that they just have to be aware of these different factors that can kind of congel into a, a very dangerous situation.